All right. Well, welcome everyone. This is Shane Gibson with Rackin, and welcome to version 42 of Meetup. Uh, today we've got some fun things lined up from the Rackin crew. Uh, our fearless UI UX dude Isaac will be showing us some really cool things about UX views, uh, creating custom columns in relation to role-based access controls. Uh, some other interesting and fun things in the portal for customization. I think we're going to get to see a little bit more info on um, filters and search and great UI goodness. Uh, also lined up today, we've got Victor talking about performance debugging API and graphing. So we've got some new capabilities that just landed recently in the last uh, not too long ago, a week or so. Uh, that allows you to do some pretty deep uh, performance uh, monitoring graphing of uh, digital rebar provision itself. Uh, this is a great tool as um, large organizations are moving towards the thousands and tens of thousands of machines under control for provisioning with digital rebar. And then I will talk a little bit about uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, Server 7.7, and building and deploying uh, mutable images through the image builder uh, and image deploy tools. So that's a little bit of a refresher on the mutable images, but it's a new OS pattern for us that we're supporting and probably new for a lot of you out there as well. And what else? I think that's all we have for the lineup. We'll always uh, make room for community feedback or questions towards the end. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Isaac. Isaac, I, here we go, all yours. Can you pass it off to Isaac Laptop? Uh, you have to request control. Or no, I'm sorry. You just you should be able to share from either one. I have my uh, laptop with the screen sharing. Oh, I can share from either? Cool. Awesome. Do you see it? Yep. Looks good. Awesome. This is our newest UX. Oh, sorry, let me introduce myself. I'm Isaac on the Rackin team. I do a lot of our UX work. Um, I have a deployment here with a bunch of fake machines, about 200 exactly, uh, all with human names and some fancy metadata. Um, and I'm going to be showing off some custom column stuff I've been working on. Uh, so as you can see, I've got a fake operating system, a fake manufacturer. And I really like to show some cool icons in the machines table uh, to make it easier to see that information. Previously, it was not, uh, you could not view params in this table. And that has been something we've been working on and getting a feature. So first off, we're going to go to the catalog. And under enterprise, we have something called UX views. I'm going to install the most latest. And we got this fancy new progress bar. Once that's done, you have to refresh the UX and you get this new dropdown. This shows you all of your available roles that you have uh, in UX views. So UX views now, rather than based on the ID uh, and your user role, it is now based on something called available roles inside of the object. Applicable roles, sorry. Um, so first, I'm going to duplicate our super user role. I'm going to call this one super user demo. Um, so I'm not going to do anything initially because I just want to uh, create it and have it be selectable. Uh, but now, uh, whenever we have this super user demo role open, we can actually edit these columns. So by default, it's just going to be all the existing columns. But as I mentioned earlier, we have this cool extra metadata, uh, which is our manufacturer and our fake OS. So as most of these devices or machines are completely fake, I'm going to remove almost everything uh, from our columns and create a new one. So first off, to add params uh, in a custom column, you type param, colon, and then the name of the param. So we're going to do inventory manufacturer. Oop. Uh, so this all show off just adds manufacturer to the table. 
oh, I forgot to select or update the UX. So now I've got this effectively four column view with a bunch of manufacturers. And these are basically random. I've got 200 of them. Uh, I just have a script that creates a whole bunch of them. Uh, but this information I want to make into a easier to understand format, which would be icons. So a super cool new feature we added effectively yesterday is this extra colon, which lets you add rendering information. So I'm going to say that this is going to be a logo. So I'm going to do type equals logo. And these are manufacturer logos. Uh, I have some documentation showing you what's available uh, that we can link later. Um, and I also want to make sure the column name is not a name as much as it is an icon to shrink that column down as much as possible. So I'm going to use something called icon name, which sets the column label to an icon. Uh, and then a hover tooltip, which is icon title, which is now manufacturer. So whenever we save this right here, uh, you can either click here to refresh it or uh, refresh the whole page. I think I have to refresh the whole page. Now we have on the far right this column with icons showing what was previously text which is super cool and super useful. Um, so what I'm going to do now is show off some other features of that new custom column uh, UX view feature. Um, first off, I'm going to move this further over to the left. And I'm going to uh, create a column for the OS. Uh, it's very similar. Uh, the param I made is called fake OS. Um, it's just a string. It's going to have the same so type, type equals question, logo. Sorry, question what? for you there on a question on that, Isaac. So the, the fake OS is just a parameter you've added to the host that you want to use as the index. So if somebody wanted to use this, they would need to add whatever param to the, each of the machines that has the signature of the OS for it. Exactly. You can make this pretty much anything. And in our color demo video, uh, we showcase how to set params on a machine through a task in a stage in a workflow. You can actually use anything in a workflow to set params and then use those params in the custom columns to show off perhaps an operating system. So if you had a boot environment that was loaded, uh, you could associate some sort of param with that and then that would be effectively shown up in the table. And we're going to get into that probably in some future updates of our UX. Uh, but continuing, now our logo type is going to be OS. Uh, our icon is going to be a dot circle outline. And our icon title is going to be OS. Uh, so this is effectively the same thing. I don't know what it's unhappy about. Um, what did hmm. I do wrong? What? Dot did circle outline. You got spaces or underscores or no spaces would be fine. Yeah. I think it just was not happy at the moment. What the heck? Yeah. You think I have to clear Columns, it? Machines five colon value is null. Yeah, you Restart. Restart. Lovely. Can't have a demo without bugs. Um, so we'll try again. And it worked magically this time, uh, not changing anything. And now I have to refresh the page to get our new UX views. And now I have cool OS icons on the right. Um, so we can actually filter based on some new stuff. We actually have regex filters. Um, regex filters are just regular regex. They're not amazing. So, but they're cool. Uh, so this is anything that has two A's in it, uh, which would be, I don't know, names like Gabriella or Maya. Um, I'm pretty confident this works on 
params. We might have a bug right now that doesn't make that work. Nope. Okay. So we'll have to work on that. Um, what was I saying? All right. Uh, sorry. I'm going to add one more uh, column to our uh, machines view, and that's going to be rather than a logo, a custom icon. Uh, and this one is just going to be a debug icon. Uh, and we know that the debug param is RS debug enable. So I'm going to have this param, and I'm going to make the type rather than a logo, I'm going to have it be an icon. Icon name is the column title or column icon. And the icon title is the hover. And then finally, we have something called icon map. Um, icon map is effectively saying any icons in this map that align with a value from the param will be replaced with a specific icon. So the if RS debug enabled is set to true, I'm going to have that icon be check. Um, and by default, it's nothing. But if you want to have a default icon, you can do a asterisk. And then we could do, I don't know, a times, which is an X, or nothing. We're going to do nothing for now. And then going back to our machines view after refreshing, uh, nothing right now has debug enabled. But I'm going to select every single name that has two A's in it. And I'm going to add the debug param to it. Look, they all get little checks. Got little bug icons, all nice and pretty. And now once I load the rest of the machines, now we can see all of the ones on the right with that little check icon that have two A's in the name which is super nice. And that's rather than having the word true in the table or having extra stuff, we have these nice tiny little icons. Um, and that's effectively uh, most of what you can do with custom columns right now. You can do other things like add custom links uh, across the UX or external links. Um, you can add, uh, I think that's it. Uh, you can make it so it's a sortable column if you want. So if you want to be able to sort by name by clicking on this bug for whatever reason, uh, that is possible. Um, but yeah, look forward to more exciting custom UX, customizable UX features. So um, also one of the interesting things, uh, can you show us just the, the UX views is just content, right? So you can create a content pack that customizes the portal experience based on uh, your roles. So like um, Isaac was showing earlier, we created a super user demo as a role and uh, using that role. So if someone logs in with that specific role entitlement, then their views would be customized. So you can tie all of this into uh, the role-based access control mechanisms, as well as the UX views being content themselves. Yeah. Um, so works. that can be maintained and managed as a content pack. Yeah, and it works slightly different now. You don't have to clone the roles anymore. The UX views picked up a um, applicable roles column. And so you don't have to create new roles for people. You can say for that role, these views become available. And then the drop down in the upper right, upper left corner now gives you the ability to switch between those view <coughs> sets. So you don't have to do the gyrations uh, that you were, had to use before to generate the, the switching. So you don't have to create custom users and you don't have to create custom roles and you don't have to assign those roles to the users. You can still do all that, but this way it allows you to right. extend basic functionality without it. So a given user now can have a, a set of views that they can cycle through without having to change role to do crazy gyrations to see it. Right, I see what you're saying, yeah. And that's the applicable role as opposed to the actual role that's applied uh, to, a machine, to a user's rights based on the RBAC system. The implication is that if you have that role, you are allowed to have this view. Yep. Set of views, so. 
Yeah. Makes sense. And so, um, Vic, uh, Isaac, can you show us the, the code view here, which is uh, for the role? So the um, code icon, upper right, locally, next locally managed, JSON. So this is just like anything else. Content pack can be added in. You can maintain your roles and stuff. There's a lot here obviously going on, and the UX does a nice job of making it easier to uh, modify and break down and edit components. But ultimately, once you know what you want to build in there, that's uh, injectable as content packs. Cool. Any uh, questions on the UX views? Isaac, do you have any more to show us there? Is that wrap up what you've got? That's mostly everything we've got right now. Cool. Uh, any questions from community? Do, 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 no questions from community. Victor. Thank you, Isaac. That's awesome. Really appreciate that it. One. It's really cool to be able to customize the portal and portal views and make all that stuff magically delicious or something. <laughs> uh, Victor, um, debugging API, do you have something to show us or are we just doing a talky talk session? Uh, I've got some stuff to show you. Just all right. Get it up here. All right. So I've gone ahead and so one of the things that I've added over the last uh, week or so to DR provision and DERP CLI um, in order to troubleshoot some performance issues that one of our customers was having was is a uh, full on set of APIs for, gra for grabbing performance data from running DR provisions. And I'm going to show you how that's done. So on this side, I'm going to go ahead and uh, spam DR provision with a, a lot of work eventually. And then on this side, I'm going to tell DR provision to uh, grab a sample of what's running on the CPU for the next 20 seconds. So I'll go ahead and get that started. And then I will create 200 machines in parallel. And we'll wait for this to finish. Do, 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 yes, yes. I should have had it only grabbed for 10 because 20 was really way too much now. And let's take a look at it. All right, and so here's what the system was doing. Let's switch it to something slightly easier to see. And here's what all of the time that Deer Provision was uh, spending while creating 200 machines in parallel. We see that uh, Deer Provision thought it only took uh, 4.7 seconds, and it spent most of its time handling TLS handshakes it looks like. So this is the sort of data that's uh, really useful to be able to grab if you notice that your provision seems to be running slow for whatever reason. Uh, we now have uh, the capability to grab CPU performance data. There's also memory. Let me just uh, show you what all we have available. So we've got a lot of different types of uh, debug data we can grab. We can grab CPU profile information, um, live memory, all memory that's been allocated, um, what's been causing us to block on various different things, and stack traces from all running Go routines and all Go routines that have uh, created OS threads. And incredibly detailed tracing information that uh, shows us exactly what their provision is doing at all points in time. Um, this trace data takes about a uh, 
30 to 50 percent uh, performance hit. So we don't necessarily want to run it all the time or run it for long periods of time if the system is heavily loaded. But everything else only takes about a one to two percent performance hit. So it's safe to gather whenever the system is heavily loaded. And with that data, we've been able to make uh, several performance improvements to DR provision over the last week. I've gathered some before and after data. So this is showing CPU utilization from version 4.0.14, running our uh, integration tests. And we can see that uh, in total, the integration tests took uh, 26 seconds of CPU time, and they spent a lot of time performing PLS handshakes. That's a total of uh, two and a half and five, so seven and a half seconds out of our total just doing TLS handshakes. A lot of time spent doing user password checking, which is kind of expected, and a lot of time in the garbage collector. This is a trace from the same integration test, but on 4.0.18, which was uh, released either late last, last night or early this morning. And we can see that between the two, we've uh, gone down to just 17 total CPU seconds, and we've more or less completely eliminated uh, PLS overhead. So that was a reduction from, what did you say it was, 24 to 17 or something? Yeah, 24 to 17.8. 17. 17. 24 to yeah. 17 total seconds spent running. Okay. Along the way, we've also decreased the amount of total memory we are allocating by uh, getting rid of a lot of uh, allocation heavy functions. Um, we've gone from allocating uh, 14 gigs over the lifetime of the integration test to down to uh, 11 gigs. Um, that includes memory that's gone through the garbage collection cycle, so it uh, doesn't really represent how big the workload is in memory. It just represents how much uh, total churn has happened in memory. So we've cut down on that a lot, too. And if we really need to get into debugging things, we also have detailed tracing and detailed tracing information on everything that is uh, that was causing DR provision to block and all of the uh, routines that it's been running in parallel. So for instance, uh, here we can see all of the background workers that have been running and what they are been uh, doing. And this is useful mostly for myself and Greg to really get into what is uh, what might be causing things to block if we run into performance issues from a customer just uh, during internal testing. But uh, so that is pretty much it for performance troubleshooting. We've got a lot of uh, extra stuff that is available to us now to look at and uh, continue to make performance improvements in DR provision. And we can do it all on uh, customer running systems. That's awesome. Um, that will make a significant difference as we're pushing into customers with the tens of thousands of machines mm -hmm. uh, under management and particularly for a multi-site manager, which rolls up and aggregates a lot of uh, information to a single uh, manager or HA manager pair, uh, which is where a lot of heavy performance uh, impacts will really hit DRP. It's really nice to be able to get really clear visibility on what's happening inside the internals and be able to figure out what makes sense to triage and prioritize uh, fixing uh, any performance bottlenecks, which we've seen a huge gain already. I you mean, know, on the order of uh, what, 10 to 15% performance improvement uh, just in a few days of running this already. Mm -hmm. And uh, that doesn't count uh, the overall latency improvements, which are hard to see on either of these. Um, I mean, you may have noticed it took me less than five seconds to create 200 machines in parallel. And that can be drastically improved from there with some enhancements that I've been working on in the, on, in the background. Nice. 
Very, very nice. Right. And uh, other than that, I am open for questions. Peanut gallery, questions, comments? Throw peanuts at Victor. <laughs> I don't know, you like peanuts, Victor? Yes. What, she's gonna be like deathly allergic to peanuts or something. <laughs> you do like peanuts, okay, good. <laughs> All right, um, Victor, thank you very much. We really look forward to uh, seeing the fruits of the, that work as we move forward um, in helping performance tune and increase uh, digital rebar's already pretty amazing capabilities on a performance scale perspective to be even better and manage very large fleets of uh, both uh, large data center workload environments and also thousands of edge sites where we're really gonna start um, stressing and pushing uh, a lot of uh, performance uh, uh, requirements and uh, capabilities on the DRP side when we have lots of um, multiple edge sites under control. Um, all right, so I have, oh, it's switching windows all over the place on me. Thank you, Zoom. All right, so uh, first I wanted to show um, on uh, what Isaac was talking about earlier on UX views, he's also been working away at helping uh, increase uh, documentation on UX views itself. And for those of you who have not found in our documentation yet, and I don't know why you haven't found it, but go look, go look today from the table of contents. We have this uh, content packages and plugins. And so all of the different content packs and plugins are documented self-documented and then rendered here. Uh, some of these are still very poorly documented because they existed prior to our uh, dynamic documentation system. We haven't gone back and cleaned them up yet, but as we iterate over each of the various uh, content pieces and packages, we have been getting those cleaned up. And uh, Isaac has indeed been adding uh, documentation to the UX views works. So if you have questions on how UX views works, please refer to the content uh, documentation that he has here. If anything's not clear from there, obviously hit us up on community. Um, also, if you are uh, working in an environment where you suspect there might be some performance issues, talk to us because obviously we have some really cool tools now to be able to benchmark and determine what's happening under the hood and try and determine where things might be blocking or slowing down or causing problems. Uh, I'm gonna switch over to Immutable, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, Server 7.7. Seven. Uh, for uh, today's demo, I have uh, two machines that I'm gonna uh, represent uh, in the workflow process. I have this one machine called Image Builder, uh, which is the machine I'm gonna run a workflow on to create a customized uh, Rails 7.7 7 deployment. And once that customization is done through a workflow, standard workflow, so you can build up workflow with stages, tasks, and um, templates as you would normally do for deploying operating systems, then we'll use the image builder uh, content to clean, go back and roll up uh, that operating system, create a gold master single artifact. Uh, in this case, we're gonna do a root file system tarball which is one of the most compact and efficient uh, formats for deployment because it takes a, a couple gig sized uh, VM uh, sort of environment or physical machine install environment and rolls it uh, back down to uh, anywhere on the order of uh, around 400 to 500 megabyte in size, uh, which is much uh, lighter weight and friendlier for deployment through the image deploy uh, tooling, which I'll demonstrate on this machine, Clone01. So both machines are sitting here in Sledgehammer uh, and ready to work. Uh, part of what's gonna happen also is integration with Red Hat Subscription Manager and uh, activating entitlements uh, in the uh, image that we build up as part of the customization, uh, activate those entitlements uh, for the specific machine and then enable a bunch of the rail repos. Uh, that whole process is relatively slow uh, because Rails uh, repo uh, mirrors are ungodly slow at serving the package uh, lists. And the Rail RPM repo itself is some 400 megabyte in size compressed. And it takes a long time to download at really slow speeds. So 
I'm going to two-step the process here because we don't all want to sit around and wait for 15 minutes for the rail repo stuff to do its business on the image build. Uh, what I have already staged is, oh, and I just broke my stuff. I was just broke my image deploy possibly. Um, hold on. I was cleaning things up and I got too aggressive. So, All right, so I have a pre-built image here uh, from uh, yesterday or I don't know what, two days ago, uh, Sunday I built this. And so this is uh, basically a duplicate copy of uh, what I'm gonna build in the image builder. And I'm gonna use that for the image deploy piece so we don't have to wait on the builder to happen. So in the file server space, we'll see that we have uh, this uh, image uh, date stamped uh, 0825 uh, with ID E75 uh, string prefix in it. Uh, the image builder will create a new builder, and when it gets done, we'll eventually see that plop out here. I'm not sure if we'll see that in time, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and kick off the image build process, and I'll show you what's happening uh, under the scenes, uh, behind the scenes while it's going. Uh, so I'm going to do this image builder rail with Ansible, so this is the customization for the workflow that includes uh, Ansible and the Ansible uh, repo stuff. We see the machine in the background is kicking over. Uh, we have... I think I have uh, KExec OK set in, in yes in uh, the global profile, so we get some pretty fast reboot actions out of the machines. Really nice uh, after going through all my ESXi work recently to be able to get KExec from Linux to Linux. But what's happening here is we have this workflow, which is just a, a standard OS install workflow. There's a couple of image builder um, pieces that bracket it that are necessary. Um, for the image build process. So I've actually kind of rolled the OS install and the image build roll-up process into one workflow. That could be broken out where you build your OS and you come back and then you do your roll-up of your image uh, later on. Uh, that also is applicable to brownfield environments. So if you need to cut and paste in an existing server, you can potentially use the image builder to come back and create an image of it and then uh, make uh, clones or duplicate uh, deployments of it. In this case, we just have a decorator stage that uh, sets a start. Uh, we do the actual Rail 7 server install. So this is going to kick off and do the standard kickstart process uh, and then um, pull down all of the packages and all of that fun stuff. Part of the standard kickstart process sets up a, D a DRP CLI agent and runner within the uh, Anaconda kickstart environment which is where we then start feeding stages and tasks to it to be able to do the Red Hat subscription uh, registration. So this interacts with a subscription manager. Uh, hopefully it'll be up today. I find that their service is down regularly and it fails. And I haven't done enough defensive coding around this yet to catch the network failures on their side. I'll get that beefed up here shortly. Uh, but then we're going to also uh, uh, inject SSH keys into the host. So uh, specifically in the case of Ansible, so you know we're enabling Ansible in this environment. We all know that Ansible is um, is agentless, right? So now we have to install SSH keys to allow that agentless access through some other process uh, SSH. It's not that SSH is acting as the agent for us. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going on my Ansible uh, agent rant here. Um, so we're inject the SSH keys for Ansible to be able to do its uh, work uh, and then actually install Ansible. Uh, and it's, this is a pretty simple process. I'm not doing much customization here. I'm just doing the actual yum minus y install Ansible against the rail uh, Ansible repo. That's all basically it's doing. Uh, set up the runner service as a post install so the machine uh, can be manageable from DRP going forward. And then the real heavy lifting of the image builder process starts in this image builder stage uh, where we reset all the package repos, remove all the package repository uh, metadata information and cache uh, information because that often, particularly in Red Hat's case, is several hundred megabytes of data that you don't necessarily need to carry in the images. Um, we're going to update packages. So th this will do a... Um, a package update, uh, install cloud init. So if you want to do any customization of your images when you're deploying them through the cloud init process, this adds the hooks in to be able to do that. We do some other uh, clean, oh, I'm sorry, the image builder cleanup is where we actually wipe uh, all of the package repo metadata. The reset package repos just sets all the package repos. It's kind of poorly named. Um, but then the last task that happens is we actually capture th that image and, and roll that image up. 
And that's the sort of the major meat of what's happening uh, with the uh, with the uh, roll up there. And we see that it's uh, actually gone through the OS install and now it's running the Red Hat Subscription Manager install. So it's uh, walking through the uh, Red Hat Subscription Manager uh, activation process. And at some point we should see it pop up in the Red Hat uh, portal. And is it is it there? Is it there? Is it there? Is it there? It should be there. There we go. So there's image builders popped up and now it's uh, been uh, activated for uh, you, um, Red Hat subscription services. So it's uh, busy doing its thing, but let's go ahead and show the interesting part. So uh, we have uh, Clone01 here. Uh, we're going to control the deployment of the image based on the standard image deploy um, where we set the image OS and image type to Linux and TGZ, which is the root file system type. And then we grab our uh, tarball. So if you remember, I said the uh, 2019 825 and the E75 image, uh, that's where um, the, the references here are to that existing image. So going forward, if you wanted to use the new image that's being built in the background, you'd modify this image URL parameter to point to your new image uh, once it's done being built. So now that we have image deploy telling it what to do, uh, we've got our machine and sledgehammer here. Uh, we're going to take our machine and just drop it into the good old standard image deploy stage. And it should kick off and start doing its business. You'll see the uh, machine has probed the disks. We see the disks are starting to get mounted and uh, stuff done to it. But uh, essentially, the main lifting of curtain deploy uh, from our standard process is uh, deploying that image uh, from the Red Hat or not Red Hat, the digital rebar file server space. So the image is being laid down, um, laid down relatively quickly on disk and doing its completion and setting up all of its appropriate funness on the, the image. And it won't take very long. In a few seconds here, it should kick over uh, when it finishes with a draft cut uh, and then boot into the new image. Um, so that's sort of the immutable uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, extending the image builder uh, capability to recognize rail environments, uh, interact with the Red Hat subscription manager, and uh, deploy, uh, create and then deploy a custom uh, rail 7.7 image. Um, and there you go. Any uh, questions on that? All right, we like it. Um, so we are should be booting here into the final OS. Um, we still have uh, in the background, like I said, the image builder process is chugging along, taking its uh, merry old time uh, doing a rail uh, repo management stuff. Ultimately, this will wrap up, finish up, and then create the image. And then we'll see the image uh, if we were sitting around here waiting on it, we would see the image show up here. Uh, we've booted into our uh, clone deployed image. So you'll see the uh, E75 uh, times uh, image identity stamp in the Etsy issue. Uh, it's just a small customization to the image deploy. So we know what image was responsible for building this machine. So we see that this machine was built successfully with uh, that, this previous image that was uh, rolled out. Uh, that's all I have to demonstrate. Um, we are, we've got plenty of time if there's any questions from community. I have one question. Fire away. Did your Clono one register in the Red Hat portal as well? N yeah, no, it, it didn't. That's a good question. And there's nothing preventing it from being enrolled except for the fact that I'm running a, um, uh, demo eval license and they only allow me one license at a time. So oh, okay. um, I do have a, a stage that does unregister machine. So uh, part of the, the workflow that could happen is after you build the image in this sort of specific instance, I could deregister or unregister the machine, which frees up the entitlement rights for that. So in my case, if I had done the unregister uh, stage uh, after the image was done deploying, then I could uh, enroll the new image uh, through the same exact uh, registration stage. So the registration stage, which is happening right here right now, 
is the same stage that we'd run in the post install to register the new machine. So that, that mostly comes down to a, a rights entitlement issue with uh, Red Hat Subscription Manager. There are certainly, um, um, I, I wouldn't say that this uh, Red Hat Subscription Manager interaction stuff that I've written so far is very bulletproof yet. Um, I found lots of ways that it, it fails and does interesting things. So it needs a little bit more sort of defensive coding around it um, to be production grade, but it's, it's getting there. It's It's getting there. Any other questions? There we go. So it finished the final uh, um, registration process. So now it's rolling up the image, uh, coming off the actual uh, image builder. Uh, and that process also takes a little bit of time because it's uh, doing a tarball across the, the root file system, the rooted root file system environment you know, within the uh, Anaconda installer. All right, no questions. Um, Oh, uh, Chris Trees was asking, technically you don't need Ansible, correct. Don't need Ansible for any of this. It's just a demonstration of customizing what your gold image might look like, that's all. Um, there are a lot of people that seem to like Ansible, so I thought that would uh, appeal to some people in conjunction with the agent list uh, requirements of deploying SSH keys on each of the hosts that Ansible would manage if An Ansible had an agent that it needed to, to manage machine. Sorry, rant over. Uh, maybe not. Anytime I say Ansible, I will probably rant like that. Just saying. Uh, the process on the image deploy finished up, so we'll see actually that it staged the images here. So the new image is uh, date stamped uh, August 27th uh, with a CF99 uh, prefix on it. So that image is now available. So you could uh, copy this link in and drop it into the uh, image deploy profile to be able to deploy that image version. So you'd replace this image deploy URL with that, that specific uh, image instance. So there you go. It did manage to finish up successfully in time. So that's pretty cool. All right, no further questions, Chris, BJ, team. Awesome, thank you very much, everybody. That's a wrap on V042 uh, Digital Rebar Provision Meetup. Uh, so had some really great topics on cool. UX views from Isaac, um, performance uh, debugging API from uh, Victor, and some significant performance gains that have been realized already from that work, and um, image builder, image deploy with Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Shane.